met quite a few folks from Arizona and I love you Arizona people. The other thing I, I just want to say is I uh, also try to always speak in I statements. I'm not a professional in the field. I'm not, I'm not an expert on the subject. I, uh, I just share my experience, strength and hope and hope that um, that uh, facilitates more fellowship and more uh, and better recovery for all of us. So um, I just, I don't, I, I have an outline for today, um, but, you know, sometimes God has other plans. So I'm just uh, going to allow spirit to flow through me and share with you. Um, the, the, the little bit of the outline, if you're like me, I, I kind of like to have predictability and, and know what uh, what's going on. So I'll just give you a quick idea of what I have in mind. I'm just going to share a bit with you about my recovery and how I got into CODA and my recovery path. And then I would like to go ahead and talk uh, on the fourth step and a process I use that is part of the fourth step in healing uh, past wounds. That's been really beneficial to me uh, that I've learned through the fellowship, um, through the uh, blessing of working with um, Ken R, one of the co-founders of this program. And um, I really, I really believe through working this step and working this process, it's a it process that's really catapulted my recovery to a completely different level uh, than it's ever been at in the past through um, my past years of recovery. So uh, like all of us, we're probably all here because, you know, there were some childhood wounds and some trauma in our past. And um, I'm, very, very grateful, first of all, to say, oh, I got a little choked up here. Um, one of the biggest blessings for me and what I like to um, really share with people is in spite of the, oh, gosh, what a surprise here. <laughs> in spite of the traumatic childhood that I had, I was really, really blessed with um, – coming full circle with both of my parents before they passed away. Oh, so, um, well, it's part, part of my story, you know, the trauma and what I went through as a, as a small child, um, my life changed completely as an adult with my parents. And I'm, um, that's part of my recovery story as well. So sometimes people, when they hear little bits and pieces about my past, they wonder how I could have ever, you know, why. And then I, they hear me talk about this wonderful relationship I had with my mom. It's, you know, they, they can't quite, quite sort that out, how that happens. But at any rate, um, by the time my, uh, my mom passed away, uh, I was like best friends with her. She, I could, I could, um, I could share with her anything. I could share with her more than I could share with a best girlfriend. And she didn't judge me and she didn't try to tell me what to do. She just simply helped guide me to find the answer for myself. So that's been a huge gift. Um, but my parents, you know, they had wounds of their own and they had a real love hate relationship. And uh, while I was growing up, they were married and divorced to each other three times. So that gives you some kind of an idea as, the as to the training I got in how to operate in relationships. So it should come as no surprise by the time I was 27 years old, I was marrying my third husband. Uh, that's what I learned. I learned that, you know, if things aren't working out, then I'm out of here. Um, the only difference between myself and my parents was I, I married a different man. They just married each other. So... Um, it was, uh, my mom was an alcoholic and um, both of my parents were abusive in their own ways. Um, my, recovery my, my recovery really started as a teenager because I ended up in Alateen. And uh, then shortly after that I ended up in Adult Children of Alcoholics, ACA, and CODA when it first came out. And it's interesting because when I ended up in ACA, my drinking really took off. And um, no surprise there, it's not too fun to look at the past. And so that really catapulted me into some, 
some uh, heavier drinking and acting out. Um, I learned as a I learned as a very small child through sexual inappropriate behavior that um, I got the idea that sex equaled love, and um, I'm sure. Uh, anybody that's experienced that recognizes that usually when abuse occurs, um, it doesn't just happen once. It's, it's, it's like a person that's been abused kind of carries the sexual energy that's um, an attraction to perpetrators. And so um, it, my experience was that it wasn't just experienced as a, as a very young girl with, with sexual inappropriate behavior. It just continued throughout my life with teachers and counselors and priests and, um, you know, anybody I tried to reach out to. And I couldn't quite get out of the cycle of, of um, trying to find love because I, did, I, because I had that attachment disorder, if you will, growing up where I didn't have that, that, that love and care. So I was reaching out in the only way I knew how to try to be loved. Um, so it kind of, I kind of, I kind of ended up in um, a cycle of, of drinking and using drugs and trying to get love and ended up ending up in really um, unhealthy situations. So um By the time I was 26, I um, finally, I don't know what happens. I don't know if, you know, I, I believe it's a gift from God as well as my own efforts to um, listen to the people God had placed in my life to get sober. So I was married to my, uh, I got married at 17 years old to my first husband uh, to get out of my home life. I wasn't, you know, he was more like, seemed more like a brother to me than somebody I was in love with. Um, and that last, I had a beautiful baby daughter at 19 from that marriage. And then two years later, got a divorce, met my second husband and kind of had a love hate relationship because I really didn't know how to operate in relationships, hadn't learned those skills. And we went back and forth in a love hate relationship for about five years and thought, gosh, things aren't working out. So what should we do? Well, let's get married because, you know, that'll solve everything. So so we got married, and uh, about two to three weeks later, um, I decided to get sober. And since I was his drinking buddy, he didn't like that. And so we ended up a, um, divorced within six months. So um, through, through going, I, I got sober through AA, and... That's when really the process of working the steps kicked in for me, and I started to do the best I could do with them. I, I recognized after coming into Coda, especially with the fourth step, it was uh, it wasn't close to being finished. Uh, so I'll go into that a little bit more when we talk about the fourth step. Um, and a year later, I'd been in sober a year. I met my third husband, and um. We were married for 23 years. Um, it, was a, it was a very safe place to be. He was a very loving man, very kind. He really adored me and treated me, you know, really, really well. So it was a, a very safe place for me to be. And so my codependency and my acting out um, kind of lay dormant during that time that I, we, we, I mean, we had our ups and downs, but I felt very safe. So I didn't, I wasn't, I was in a really good place. I was clean and sober. Um, so like I said, we were married 23 years. And in July of 2012, he suddenly passed away of an unexpected heart attack. <clears throat> and that really kicked me into uh, my codependence in a very, very big way. Um, I met a man pretty quickly after my husband passed away, who was very charming. And, um, you know, I was probably the most broken I'd ever been in my life. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of fell into this relationship with him that turned out to be um, uh, 
one of those relationships you hear about CODA where you stay in harmful situations way too long. And I saw the red flags. Um, I saw the red flags from the beginning, uh, but I didn't, you know, but I wanted to ignore them. And it's interesting because, you know, the way I was raised was, um, and in my growing up days, I always wanted, you know, my mom was, like I said, she was an alcoholic and she attempted suicide several times. And it was always like walking around in eggshells and, and, you know, what, what can I do to save her or fix her or, or have her not drink or have her not try to kill herself. And it was always this attitude of trying to come up with the next, the next right thing that's going to make everything okay. And so I had a really high tolerance for dysfunction and it served me well as a child. But as I got older and particularly in this relationship that I got involved with after my husband passed away, it didn't serve me very well because I kept trying to, you know, the next brightest thing to, so that it would work so that I would be loved so that I could feel safe. Um, but the reality was I, and what, what started becoming more and more clear I, for, through the four years I was with this man was he was a sociopath and he was a dangerous person. Um, it turned out that he got arrested while he lived with me and lost his job and things started coming to light that he was an ex-con. I don't, and I don't mean an ex-con. He was still a con in all, all the ways cons can con people, but he was an ex-convict with felonies and it all started coming out. <clears throat> and ultimately, um, he staged a burglary in my home and was going to um, try to collect on a life insurance policy and take my life. So um, it's hard for me to say that. I've actually never <clears throat> said that in a setting like this because it's, it, it took me a long time to come to terms with the dangerous situation I put myself in. Um, but I say that because I, I want to stress how um, dangerous codependency is and how far I had to go with my life at risk before I was able to wake up and get some help. So I was finally able to, at that point, <clears throat> get out of the relationship and uh, with my life. And that's when I met Christine and Payson and met Ken and started the process of trying to figure out how I could be present for myself in my own life and have recovery and not have to cling to somebody else so that I would feel okay. And it's been an amazing process. Um, it's been uh, scary and difficult, um, but the inverse effect of that has been the freedom I've experienced from doing the work. Um, I know when I started you know, going to meetings and working the steps and working with Ken. Um, every time I try to look at what I needed to look at my past and make peace with my past, I'd get really sleepy, kind of like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz in the Field of Flowers. I mean, I would just like almost instantly put my head down on the desk and go to sleep when I try. So I don't know where we're at with time. Am I okay? Good? Yeah. Okay. So um, it was interesting to, because basically what I had to do was kind of write out my story, you know, and for the very first time, what I did in the, in the questionnaire that I was given, um, I, I really was the most honest I'd ever been about everything. And I put it all out on paper and I started, I started the willingness to go forward to look at the past and not look at the past and just be able to regurgitate it as somebody else's story or a story I'm very, I was very detached from. But I was, I was starting the process of being able to connect with my heart. And a comment that Ken made to me as I was kind of just regurgitating my story to him and how much history I had with recovery, you know, I'd done ACA and CODA and Al-Anon and AA, and I'd done the John Bradshaw inner child work, and I'd done all that, you know, so I was telling Ken all this, and, and he said to me, you know, you're, you're just, 
you're talking as if you're telling somebody else's story with no feeling. And he said, you know, um, the journey and the challenges going from here down to here, which was the longest journey that, you know, one could ever have to make. Um, I'm, I'm very intellectual. And if, if, you know, if I can think my way out of something, I'll do it. And I've tried for years to think my way out of, you know, my history. And I couldn't do that. I had to go to my heart to feel it. Um, but I received so many gifts from doing that. I barely got out of high school. Like I said, I was married at 16 or moved out of the house at 16, married at 17, my first husband, barely got out of high school, didn't think I was smart. I thought the only thing I had going for me was, you know, somebody would love me if they thought I was pretty and, and, uh, and they could have sex with me. So um, I didn't really know there was much else. I, I didn't feel anything else inside of me. And I didn't think I was particularly bright. So after I started, um, I went and got some, some uh, professional help some, some time ago. Um, kind of at the end of that series of therapy, this, the, the therapist I was working for said, if you could do anything you wanted to do with your life as a professional, what would you do? And I said, I don't allow myself to think about that because, um, you know, it's not going to happen. And he said, okay, well, just humor me. Go away this week and come back. This is your assignment. Tell me what you'd like to do if you could do anything. So I went back and I said, well, I'd be a psychologist or a lawyer. And it sounded very silly to me. And he said, okay, well, then why don't you do it? And I, you know, I laughed. And he gave me the name of a man at a community college and said, call him. Tell him what you'd like to do and talk to him. So I did that. And... Um, I decided that I wanted to go to law school and I'd been a legal secretary and I thought I'd like to go to law school. And, and um, so I started and I told my husband, you know, I'd like to go to law school. And he said, law school, you've never even been to college. And I said, I know. And he said, it's going to take you 10 years. And I said, well, 10 years will be 10 years. You know, I'll have a degree then. And um, he said, okay, if that's what you want to do. I said, I'll work full time. I'll go to law school three quarter time at night. And so I started one class at a time at the community college and did that. And eight years later, I graduated second in my class and passed the bar exam and, and was a lawyer. And still part of me felt like this, um, I'm just kidding the world. You know, I'm just fooling the world. I'm not really smart enough to be able to do this. I'm, I don't really have it in me to do this. And, you know, another huge gift I got was working with Ken a few years ago. Um, I had a fear of financial insecurity. I was working for a firm, but I was unhappy. And I thought I wanted to go out on my own. And Ken said, why don't you do it? And I said, because I can't. So we process through, similar with the processing I'm going to talk about, we process through what those messages were, what those false messages were that kept me in a place where I didn't think I could go do that. And so once we process through that and I got to the feelings and I got to those messages and then I got to the truth, two days later, I went and quit my job and started my own practice. And that was three years ago. And I went from you know, myself and a paralegal I brought on with me to um, having eight of us now and more work than we can handle. And it's just, you know, that's, I bring that up because that's what releasing the old stuff has done for me. It has freed me up um, to have better relationships with people, to be able to move on and follow some of my dreams. Um, and it's just like, to me, this process, recovery is magical. It, has t it took me out of a prison into, you know, this open world. It took me from kind of seeing in black and white to seeing in color. It's, it's, just, it's been that um, dramatic for me. And so I love sharing about recovery. And I love encouraging um, all people, but particularly women, because I'm really connected um, you know, with my women friends, and I love to encourage people when they think I can't do something. I love to encourage them that yes, you can. So I want to just kind of go into the 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 fourth step a bit and talk to you about that. It's um, 
so the topic is healing past wounds through the fourth step. And the fourth step, I'm sure you all know it, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And like I said, I'd done the fourth step in prior programs, but I hadn't done it to the degree. What I did in prior four steps was I looked at my behavior. But what I didn't do is I didn't look beyond that to see where did those behaviors come from? Until I could understand where those behaviors came from, I wasn't changing the behavior. I mean, somewhat I was changing the behavior, but I'm still not able to really get to the point that I wanted to get at so that I could make the transfer, have the transformation within that I wanted to have. So for me, it was really, um, really seeing, doing that fearless inventory and seeing where the behavior came from. So I want to just, I want to just talk um, in code of, in the blue book, in our blue book on page 41 under step four, I just want to read just a couple of things that pop out to me about the fourth step. And it talks about searching meant to look over carefully in order to um, searching and fearless searching meant to look over carefully in order to find something lost or concealed to come to know, to learn, to seek, to conduct a thorough investigation. And fearless is courageous, bold, unconquerable. And then it talks about being at the brink of a great adventure, discovering our true selves. And again, I could look at my behavior, but until I looked at the deeper at, at, at what was going on deeper, I couldn't really make any transformation. And then it talks about this journey with God who would guide us gently along our way, because this is a really scary, was a really, what was a really scary process for me. It was um, some, it was very, very difficult. And then under the step four in our book, it says moral inventory. The word moral had many synonyms among them were words like honest, straightforward, fair, and open, not critical or abusive. So this was really about me looking at, at this um, honestly, but without being critical of myself. And then it talks about we began the spiritual journey of healing our re relationship with ourselves. And that's what, for me, it's like when I did four steps before, it was about healing my relationship with other people, making amends, things like that. Um, but this time it was really about healing the relationship with myself. And then it talks about better able to separate and appreciate our goodness from our unhealthy thoughts and behaviors. So kind of the process I talk about is, is looking at what my behavior is and then going deeper where it comes from, what the messages are, things like that. Uh, it also talks in the book about step four may appear overwhelming because it often causes memories to surface, particularly memories with feelings of pain, shame, and guilt that we tried to avoid. And that's what I did for years and years and years. Um, we rely on God to lead us on this difficult inward journey. And our courage to complete this step doesn't come from the absence of fear but our willingness to walk through it and understanding our strengths and our weaknesses, what we've become as a result of our codependence. So it talks about the step as a form of emotional surgery that requires gentleness and care. And we find it helpful to refer to step four in the, in the 12 by 12. So there's also, this is a great tool um, for working the fourth step. And Something that jumped out at me there says, but if we never change our beliefs about ourselves, we never change our behaviors. So it takes, it takes really changing, making a transformation in the beliefs that we carry about ourselves to be able to change the behavior. Otherwise, it's just all on the surface. I can do it, but, it, you know, just in, in that moment, I can do it, but it just keeps coming back. There's no real transformation without that. And it says it is our, the act of working step four that offers us the possibility of understanding and then releasing our shame. And I had so much shame, so much shame. I mean, even up to this last year, I had so much shame about being in that relationship with the sociopath and why, why 
you know, why did I allow myself in that situation? I had a lot of shame around it and I had to do a lot of forgiveness around that. So um, the, one of the tools I use is this process that goes hand in hand with the fourth step. And, and it, um, what, I, what I've learned is if I'm experience, experiencing a situation in, in my life today that causes, it's like a trigger um, or it, it, I'm, I'm getting a huge reaction over what probably a normal person would get, then I know it's probably, probably from my history showing up. And the gauge for me is if it's over a three on a scale of one to 10, then it's my history showing up. So if it's a one to a three, you know, if I'm irritated or upset or somebody bothers me and it's what a normal person would respond, would uh, feel, then, you know, I deal with it in the current situation. But if it goes over a three and I have a reaction, my heart starts racing, I get sweaty, I get, you know, my mind starts getting foggy and I start getting like numb and dizzy and I can't think, that's probably my history showing up. So what I do in that case is, Uh, sometimes I can't do it when I'm in the midst of that foggy feeling. And sometimes I have to let that subside, but I recognize it's, it's like a trigger. I'm having a reaction. But what I do is I write a sentence about a memory, the earliest memory I can have where I felt that same feeling. So an example is my dad used to be very, dismissive of me is the best word I can describe. Very dismissive. I didn't matter. I was a piece of crap. Um, he couldn't be bothered with giving me the time of day. Um, he'd be, you know, emotionally and verbally abusive. Um, I just was not loved by him. So in my current life, if I've got somebody acting dismissive of me, like I don't matter, um, I've had a tendency to go into a trigger about that. And so I'll just give you an example. Um, the first step in this process that I do on healing the, my old wounds by kind of um, doing this type of inventory is I write one sentence on what that memory was. What's the earliest memory? So as an example, um, I remember my dad. Um, thank you. Um, I remember my dad uh, standing up and when I walked into a room and he just stood up for no reason, I was about nine years old and he just kicked me across the kitchen. And so I remember feeling like a piece of shit, like I didn't matter. Um, so I went back when I had a current memory, current thought of not feeling like some, feeling like somebody was disregarding me. That's an example of what came up. So so I write a sentence. I don't get lost in the, I don't get lost in a story because if I get lost in a story, I go up here instead of down here. So I just write one sentence. The next step is I journal on how I felt at the time that happened. So, and, and it's not an exercise up here. It's an exercise of really releasing that feeling that I've held inside for all these years. So I felt, you know, I felt confused. I felt sad. I felt hurt. And I really allow the, I allow myself to embody the feelings that I felt back then and, and to actually experience them and release them. So I journal about that. And I actually, and, and not only I journal, but usually I cry, I kind of process through what that felt like. And then step three is, how do I feel today about it? Usually it's like, I'm really pissed off. I'm really angry. I'm really, really angry that I was treated like that as a little girl. I didn't deserve that. So then I write how I feel about it today. And then I write, what were the toxic shame messages I got through that experience? I'm a piece of shit. I don't matter. I'm not lovable. Um, I, I deserve abuse. You know, all the toxic shame messages that are embedded in me, I write those out. All Everything I can think of that I would have received a message from that experience. And then the next step, step four, um, excuse me, step five is, on the page next to those toxic shame messages, I write the counter affirmative truth statement. I am lovable. I am precious. I, you know, and I speak in the affirmative rather than the negative. I wouldn't say I'm not lovable. Instead, I'd say I'm lovable. Always, always affirmative. And I write those to counteract the toxic shame messages that I received as a child. And then after that, I do what's called the power work of 
I bring the person that did perpetrated whatever that was on me into the room in my mind's eye. I see what they're wearing. I see the look on their face. I see their attitude. I feel their attitude. They're right there in front of me. And when I do this, I make sure I'm in my, I make sure I'm in my loving parent, not my little girl, not my teen. What I've learned is I'm, you know, there, there are these different parts to me that I've learned to integrate. I operated from the child and the teen for many years, but now I know how to take care of them with this loving parent and this higher self that's part of my makeup. And I make sure I'm in that very empowered woman, that empowered loving parent. And I face that person and I tell them exactly what they did to me, exactly the result it had on me and how dare them. And I give them their anger, their shame, whatever it is back to them. And Usually when I'm doing that, sometimes I'll revert back into the little girl and start crying. And if I do that, I stop immediately because I have my little girl, my teen behind me, um, protecting them. And I'll turn back around and uh, get centered again and, and, and take care of myself, get centered again in that loving, um, loving parent before I turn back and finish the process with that person that I have in my mind's eye. And then I release and then I let them go. And that whole process is, um, it, I didn't believe it would really work. And the more I practiced and the more I worked with it, um, the, the process of just acknowledging the feelings, looking honestly at where it came from, looking at what I, what I was left with, what those messages were, and then just starting to create new truth messages um, really made a transformation in my life. So, um, the other thing it did for me, it started getting me in touch with my heart instead of in my, in my head all the time. I really started, um, getting the connection from here to here. I started getting more compassion for myself and learning how to take care of myself. So it's interesting. I'll just, um, I'll end with this cause we're running short of time, but um, what happens in trauma, what happened in trauma for me was I got very fragmented. So I was usually operating from my scared little girl, or I was operating from my acting out teen. Um, and I was hardly ever operating from my other selves, which are, which, which com are com comprised of my loving parent my adult who gets stressed and goes to work and knows how to think, and then my higher self. And through this process of learning how to care for myself, I've been able to integrate all of those parts of myself. And now I, more often than not these days, I walk about, around as a fully integrated recovering woman where I can allow my little girl to have fun and like at this, you know, on our break, we can dance and we can have a great time. Um, but I've always got the loving parent and the adult on board to, to make sure I'm safe, to make sure that teen doesn't act out and do things that are unsafe for her. So it's, a, it's, it's this integration process of myself that I've experienced through recovery, through the meetings, through the steps, through the, through the work, um, individual work that I've been able to do. And it's, it, it's saved my life. I mean, it's really saved my life. Um, so... I can't, you know, I can't speak highly enough for the process of working these steps and making peace with my past. It's really freed me up to have a life that I never imagined. I'm, I, you know, I live alone now. I never thought I could live alone and feel comfortable and be okay with me. And I'm, and I'm good. I'm good with me today. And it's just, it's a life beyond what I have, it's beyond what I ever imagined I could have. If you feel comfortable, I thought what we would do is to give you kind of an idea of the process um, is to write, um, if, if there's been a situation recently where you feel like you've had a reaction that's been over a normal reaction that you, you believe is a, is a reaction from an old wound, like feeling not smart enough or not good enough or not lovable. And you, and, it, and you know, that's from a past wound. Um, I would invite you 
to take out a piece of paper and write, um, and, and you can take, I don't know, maybe we'll take like 10 minutes for you to do this, but I, I can tell you um, right now what to write. It'll be just one sentence of what was that prior wound or memory you have of the first time you felt that way. Just like I said, in my current life, I felt disregarded by somebody. And then what came to mind was that time my dad kicked me across the kitchen. So, um, and sometimes people go, well, I can't really remember. And that's not a surprise because, you know, I mean, for me, I had a lot of memories blocked for a long time, but I would just reflect back on a time like if maybe if you're not feeling, you feel like you're, you know, not smart, reflect back on a time that maybe you got a message from somebody that, oh, you're never going to amount to anything. And just write a sentence, whatever that statement was, whatever that action was, just a sentence. Don't go into a story about it. Just a sentence. And then write on what did I feel when that happened, when that original incident occurred, what were my feelings? And try to allow yourself to really feel, to really Feel what that felt like, not just an exercise in your mind, oh, I felt sad, but just allow yourself to be present with that feeling and, 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 and um, embody that feeling. And then how do I feel about that now? And, you know, like I said, for me, usually it's anger, anger, and it's righteous anger that as a little girl, I should never have had to have been subjected to whatever that was. And then, right, what were the messages I got from that experience? I'm stupid. I'm not lovable. I'm ugly. Whatever those messages were that you got from that experience, write those toxic shame messages that you've been carrying around that have affected your life today. And then write, what's the truth? Because those toxic shame messages are not the truth about you. So write, what's the truth? I am precious. I'm loving. I'm smart. I'm... Uh, you know, whatever the, the truth statements are. The purpose behind this is we have all of these feelings and all of the toxic shame messages and everything compressed down inside of our body. And it's, it's kind of the final step in being able to release it. And, you know, how I was, you know, how I was taught is like, not to, not to do it from the throat, but from way down, way, 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 way down in here, just like we, we, we have it here and we want to bring it up and get it out. There's a lot of energy. And so it's, it's about releasing and giving back to that person, whatever it was they gave us, the shame, the anger, um, you know, telling them, you know, what, what, what they did. And it's, it's just a form of being able to release everything. It's called power work. Um, and it's, if you've never, experienced or done it on your own, it might be a little bit difficult to do. But if you know somebody that is familiar with it, it's really helpful to kind of walk through it with them. But it's basically it's, it's giving somebody back their shame or their anger or whatever it is that they imparted on you as a young child. And it's about becoming empowered and standing in your strength before this person that has made you so little throughout your life. For instance, it might look like it might look like like to, to my dad. It might look like, how dare you treated me? How dare you would would kick me across the room like that and treat treat me like a piece of shit? You know, I was your little girl. Your little girl is supposed to be a precious, loved uh, person in your life. You didn't protect me. You taught me how to allow men to treat me by treating me like the way you did. Um, you know, and, and anything that comes up for you like that. And I'm not going to take that anymore. I'm a lovable, precious person. I give you back that shame, that anger, that, that abuse. I'm not taking it anymore. I'm not carrying it anymore. It's yours. You're going to take it and you're going to leave because I am precious. I am loved. I deserve love. I'm embodied with love. I have people that love me in my life and I give that all back to you. I release it. It's yours. Um, and, you know, messages like that. So it, it's allowing, it's allowing that part of you to come forth and honor that feeling, honor that feeling that wasn't honored for so many years. There, there's so much hope and there's so much magic in working these steps. It's so transformational. So, you know, get a sponsor, go to meetings, do what you need to do, do the work. It's, it's, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's a process.